everybody. Uh, welcome to the Gordon L. Gross Cup Museum of Anthropology here at Wayne State University. Uh, we're here tonight to give you a special tour of our current exhibit and a little bit of behind the scenes tour of the museum. Uh, we're the only anthropology museum in Detroit, so if you haven't been out to visit us yet, we'd love to see you come by. Uh, I'm Megan McCullen. I'm the director of the Gordon L. Gross Cup Museum of Anthropology. It's great to have you here tonight. Uh, with me is one of our alums. Um, Marcy, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Marcy Hessling O'Neill. I was an undergraduate here at Wayne State University, and I was a student of Dr. Garen Montalouse in the Department of Anthropology. And I've been keeping touch over the past few years and was able to teach a class a couple years ago based on understanding Africa and the work of Dr. Montalouse. So our current exhibit uh, that we've had open since October uh, is a curated exhibit of material culture from Dr. Montalus's collection. Uh, he recently retired from our department after um, several years here, and we wanted to celebrate him and uh, get a chance to share his collection with you. So we're gonna take you through the exhibit, but first what we wanna do is show you a little bit of a hallway exhibit uh, that Marcy actually made with the students in her Understanding Africa class uh, as part of this current exhibit. So why don't you tell us about what you guys did and how it came to be that you were able to create this exhibit. Sure, yeah. So as a student of Dr. Montalus, he always talked about the importance of storytelling and material culture as ways in which communities take their culture and put it in a tangible form, but a form that's really symbolic. So every symbol has so much meaning behind it. And as I was preparing my syllabus to teach a class on understanding Africa, it happened that that would be in the same semester that Dr. Montalus was retiring. And so we offered to do something for the hallway that related to Dr. Montalus's work and wanted to sort of draw it together with broader themes of understanding Africa, the work that Montalus has done um, on the continent since the 1960s. And the way that we envisioned this was we, we looked at his life as one that began as a seed that then developed into roots, became branches of a wonderful tree that then developed its own fruit, and everyone could come away with a bit of knowledge. So we um, divided into groups, and the students in the class looked at transcripts of um, Dr. Montalus's conversation. We looked at his um, CV, his impressive CV, and his work. You interviewed him, right? So yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I interviewed him at his home after taking a look at his incredible collection of material culture. And the students were able to um, really start to understand the life of a scholar, but also the life of a storyteller and what he would bring in, not just from one country, Benin, but from um, Haiti, from Cuba, from the United States, from Canada, um, from other areas in the diaspora. And so this is what we created, sort of um, an understanding of, of his life, but also about what he has given to the community and what people can take with them which is what sort of um, demonstrated here on the, the broader panel, where we look at the, the branches where he's really like the fruits of his labor are coming um, to fruition, the trunk being really the heart of who he is. Um, and, and who he is is an anthropologist, a prince, a father, a writer, a mentor, a storyteller, and so much more. And, and I would say a curator. Yes? Yes. I have questions for you about this while we're talking about it. First of all, and if anybody who's watching has questions for us, or if you took a class with Dr. Montalus, if you went on one of his study abroad trips, please um, post that in the comments. We'd love to know uh, your memories and stories about him as well as Marcy's. So um, what tree is this? This is a baobab tree. Okay. Yes, and a baobab tree is, um, a, you can find them in Benin. There's a beautiful baobab tree on the way to the site of Dr. Montalus's main research in Elada, which we'll get to on the inside of the museum. Um, but yeah, they're, they're really monumental trees and then they provide wonderful refuge um, in the, you know, uh, for sitting underneath the tree, uh, the fruits of the tree are very um, nutritious. And yeah. I, re I remember when we were first talking about the uh, part of the exhibit to put out here, we were talking about how to try to figure out a way to talk about a life experience. And one of the habits that we have in some museums is doing timelines. We always like to do these timelines. And so uh, I loved it when you came up with this different way of thinking about how 
to tell a story of what someone has done in their life through growth and then uh, the fruits and then the regrowth. So I just yeah. think that was a really interesting, nice addition to the exhibit. Thanks. Yeah, and so like as we see that that you know someone can take the fruit of this and then and walk away with it, and it may transform into something different, which again is what we'll see on the inside of the exhibit that that the same stories and the same materials can be interpreted in many different ways. I think that is a great segue to move into our gallery. So please join us um, as we go in to see our second exhibit. Um, we actually have uh, two exhibits up right now. The newest is uh, the exhibit. Uh, of Dr. Mosseluce's material culture and research, uh, but we also have materials here that are from um, 60 years worth of collecting at the museum. The museum was established in 1958, uh, and primarily initially as an archeology span collection, uh, but it's grown over the years. So there's all sorts of different items to see here. Uh, and we're open Tuesday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, so please come by. If you want to come a different time, just uh, send us an email. Uh, we'll put the email uh, on the Facebook page and you can come join us. Uh, but we'd love to have you come see us. Uh, I forgot how we were going to start our story earlier. So I'm <laughs> going to ask you now, Marcy. Can you tell me a story? Are you ready for a story? I am ready for a story. Great. Our story rolls and turns and twists and flies and it lands right here at the Girl Scouts Museum of Anthropology with Dr. Montaloo. Yes, so uh, this exhibit was curated by Dr. Matalus and uh, one of his PhD, former PhD students, now one of our faculty, uh, Dr. Mary DeRocher. And uh, Dr. Matalus has been collecting material culture um, for his entire career. And he tells the story that when he was a graduate student in France, um, he had to go through the museum to get to his faculty members' offices. So he was surrounded by material culture and thinking about it all the time. And he really saw that to have a story and to have beliefs, you have to have them connected to your physical space. And so these things are integrated together. And uh, what you can see if we turn around here to the entranceway is object that reflects all of the different places Dr. Montalus has done research um, in West Africa, in the Caribbean, and here in Detroit. Um, and they reflect storytellers. Some of them are telling stories. They're all telling stories. Some of them have storytelling in them. Uh, there's a chair. That's a chair that you could sit in while you tell a story. But it also has a story on it. And we really see Dr. Montalus as the storyteller of the department. Um, so we really felt like this was a way to unify uh, all of his work. Uh, for those of you who have taken a class with him, you know, um, you ask a story, uh, a question of Dr. Matalus, and you get a story. Um, and that story will give you the information that you need to help understand that question. Um, do you want to tell them anything about any, do you have any favorite pieces over there or something that you enjoy I, about them? You know, I do. I have a couple favorites, but <laughs> my favorite favorite is this um, chair right here. And in Benin, this chair in the Fongbe language is called the Wachono. And it is where you will come and you will relax at the end of the day um, and maybe have a beverage to sort of w <laughs> to, to make the, the weight of the day <laughs> sort of uh, whisk away. But it's also, again, um, as Megan was saying, where someone might sit when they're going to be telling a story. And so it's a wonderful way of reclining and, and sort of leaning into the story, mm -hmm. you know? And, and you want to be there for a while. You don't want the story to end quickly. It's like you want it to get into the details, and that's a great place to sit to tell a story. Yeah, I love that picture too. Yeah, I get really interested in the beadwork. Beadwork in mm -hmm. any culture is what I get uh, really fascinated by. Um, and we have a piece here. We have several pieces in the exhibit, um, but uh, this is a Haitian uh, flag, and I just love to be. I always think about the the art artisans who create it just how much time it takes to do this. It might be because I have um, friends who are do indigenous beadwork here in the Great Lakes and just mm -hmm. to watch them do this beadwork. And they're super fast. But yeah. to make a piece this large just takes so much time and patience that I do not have. <laughs> right. uh, and so being able to have that vision of how to take this large piece of cloth and then create something using all of these tiny beads, um, I always am just uh, in awe of these pieces. So in addition to how they're used um, in activities, to also be able to think about how they're made um, and then the aesthetics of them as well. Yeah. I could stare at those all day. The piece <laughs> actually that we have in the um, 
other exhibits uh, that I picked out. We had different faculty pick out different pieces. I picked out a piece of beadwork because I'm always interested in the beadwork. I hadn't really thought about that. But um, what I noticed patterns. in the exhibit, and I know we'll get to it later, but um, is that a lot of the material culture from Haiti has more of the beadwork. Oh, okay. And I don't see that as much um, in Benin with artists. It, it exists, but it's not as prominent, which I find interesting too about the medium that people choose to use in which cultural context or, or you know, what's more popular in one place versus another is really interesting. So I've noticed that more of the Haitian art has more beadwork. Nice. That's interesting. Um, Dr. Matulis, for those who uh, don't know, uh, was uh, born and raised in Haiti uh, and then ended up doing much of his research in Benin in West Africa uh, and then has moved on to doing research uh, in the Caribbean back in Haiti and in Cuba, but then also does work here in Detroit. And so he's really been focused on um, West African communities and then diaspora communities from West Africa and looking at um, their religious practices, their material culture, how these integrate, um, and how they integrate with other um, cultures that they come into contact with. And one of his main theses, I think he would say, uh, is that um, the religion is answering the questions it needs to answer for the people that are practicing it. And so you see patterns that we're going to see as we go through here. Um, and themes that move over time. And um, uh, some of those items you'll see retained, other things you're gonna see change. Uh, it's very complex. I recommend viewing these items over and over again. I like to come in here all the time and I see new things. So um, yeah, should we take a look at uh, his field work site? Sure, yeah, let's. <laughs> all right, so the next section of the exhibit uh, really tells the story of Dr. Montalus uh, getting involved as an anthropologist doing field work. Anthropologists study cultures around the world, past and present, and they're really um, involved in immersing themselves in those cultures and trying to understand cultures by participating in the activities of a community. Uh, and so Dr. Montalus did field work in Benin um, for his doctoral work and then has continued to work there since then. And you work in Benin as well, Marcy, right? Yes, I do. I do work not in Alada. Alada is a little bit north of where I do most of my work. Um, my colleagues and I work in Cotonou, which is a coastal city. Um, but we do often pass through Alada to get to Abome, which you'll see in, as we turn the corner. Um, and so I, every time I pass through Alada, I'm just thinking of Dr. Montalus again. And when I see that one baobab tree, it sort of brings it all together. Uh, but I was super excited to see like these, his field notes from 1971, I think are really cool. And you can see um, at certain points here, he's, um, he's writing in French, and at other points he's writing in Fongbe. Um, and he would, ha when I was an undergrad, he really stressed the importance of learning the language. Yeah. Not asking people, when we go to visit other people and ask them about their culture, not asking them to do the additional work of learning our language, to tell us what they want to tell us. But we as anthropologists, it's our responsibility to learn the language that people are, are speaking in and thinking in so that they can describe things in a way that makes sense to them. And so I, I really love seeing this because M Montalus will still say to this day that he doesn't speak Fongbei well. And yet <laughs> I think many people who are, um, you know, who have, that have Fongbei as their maternal language would say he does. <laughs> he, he's, he's a wonderful linguist as well as an anthropologist. Yes, and that's true. I've heard that from a lot of his students, mm -hmm. that there's always been this emphasis that he puts on language and really understanding the languages of the places you're going to. Yeah, um, I'm really which, good. Yeah. Um, we have one other picture. We have two pictures of Dr. Matalus in the exhibit. Uh, it was hard to get pictures from him. Uh, he had lots of photos in the field, but not of himself. So. Uh, the photo that you've already seen is him with his recorder as he's um, interviewing people. But we also have an image of him uh, greeting the king of Alada, um, which shows he would take several classes um, to Benin while he was teaching here. Um, and part of what I love about the, the photo is besides just showing him, it just shows all of the activity and everything that we have in the exhibit is also in the photo in some place or another. Mm -hmm. So we've got the seat. We've got the, um, uh, the umbrellas that you're going to see in the exhibit. Um, all of these things just showing the action um, 
and, and how these pieces are actually used um, in day-to-day -day practice. Yeah, what you're looking at right here is really, I love these. Um, these are the flags of the king's list of Dahomey. So um, these are the kings from the 1600s all the way through to 1900. Um, and each king had chosen an animal that represented them um, and then another symbol that might represent them. So maybe a staff or um, uh, a, I see a, a sheath or a sword. And um, the royal um, applique artist is, was a lineage um, who would create all of these beautiful appliques and flags. And you can still find these in the, um, one of the palaces that's in Abome, which is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, and it is the palace of the King of Glele. So this is King Glele mm -hmm. of the Dahomean Empire. Um, and you can find people whose relatives made the royal appliques. And now they're making appliques for um, people who want to come by, um, art enthusiasts, material culture enthusiasts, um, and tourists and, and whatnot. So beautiful, beautiful art still being done um, by people who are of the lineage. And there's other uh, images that we put alongside it to just show other examples of um, applique and the importance of these kinds of uh, symbols everywhere. Um, in the area. So they're on stamps now. Um, they're on the umbrellas. The umbrellas are um, carried over the king. Um, they're on dance regalia. And so this is just something that's ever present there. And when I've talked to Dr. Mazaluk about it, one of the things he's mentioned is that seeing all of these symbols and being surrounded by them is part of what really got him interested in thinking about what do symbols mean mm -hmm. to the people who make them? What do symbols mean to the people who see them or interpret them? Um, and then thinking about how they're used and transformed over time. Yeah. Uh, so that's just super uh, interesting to me to think about being immersed with all the symbols. We have them around yeah. us all the time. We just don't necessarily think about it. Um, right. But there's symbols everywhere in all cultures um, representing um, different things. So these are the royal symbols. There's also um, a beautiful piece of metal work here that shows one of the uh, royal um, parades, for lack of a better term, that really also reflects um, the great artisanship um, of the metal workers, but also is telling a story about the community um, in the same way that you can tell these stories uh, through non-tangible uh, right. cultural Do heritage, cultural. Yeah. Um, and also through applique and all of these um, crossovers of different kinds of art. And you can see here um, in this brass representation of the umbrella, it's the same, it's like, you know, a modified version of this one, um, which would be held over the king. But what I also really appreciate about, these, appreciate about these umbrellas is, number one, it keeps the sun from being on you. So it's, you know, in this hot season <laughs> when it's super hot. But also, as you see how it's the material going down like that, and you can see it there. Um, the people who are walking in front would be twisting it. And this would be creating a breeze for the king. Oh. So yeah, so you get that nice little bit of a breeze coming at you. And so when you're in the palace, um, they have one that you can sort of twist and you can feel it. Nice. Yeah. And I like seeing a few different representations of it, you know? Mm -hmm. Interesting. I didn't, it makes sense that you would twist it like that, but I haven't heard that before. Yeah. So you learn new things every time you talk about the objects in a museum. So I love that. Uh, the last section that we're going to look at in Dr. Mazaluk's exhibit um, really highlights objects from his material culture collection that are focused on um, religion um, and syncretism of religion. And again, I know many of you have not met Dr. Mazaluk, but some of you have. He has a material culture lab here on campus um, that is full of all sorts of material culture um, from West Africa and from the Caribbean and from North America that is reflective of uh, religion and um, religious ideas and full. Yeah, <laughs> it is yeah. Uh, extensive. He also has an extensive collection uh, at home and he trades things in and out depending on what he's teaching, um, what he's focused on at the moment. And so uh, with this is just touching the surface. And so uh, he and Mary really had a tough time selecting just a handful of pieces to try to show his ideas. Um, so definitely come in and take a look at them. But this is just uh, the tip of the iceberg for the 
objects that he has collected as he's tried to think about and understand um, how religious practice and beliefs in West Africa, when it moved with people um, to the Caribbean and to North America, um, what was retained, what was transformed, how did they incorporate other ideas um, and objects into that. Um, and again, I get drawn to the uh, beadwork all the time, but um, that's just my favorite pieces. Uh, but in terms of meaning and ideas, I generally tell people to come in here and just absorb and, and look at the objects um, and think about, look for the patterns that they see um, and look for commonalities and distinctions. Um, but a lot of these objects reflect different individual um, loa or deities, or gods or saints, um, depending on if you're looking at the Catholic pieces, um, different um, pieces from West Africa, and there's a lot of incorporation of similar symbols in uh, different individuals, what appear to be different individuals at first glance for someone who hasn't uh, looked at them a lot the way that Dr. Margulies has. Didn't you yeah. say you saw him give a lecture on these two pieces? Yeah, this was actually my the first time he gave a lecture the outside of the classroom where I saw the material culture that he was talking about in class, mm -hmm. and he gave a lecture on religious syncretism. And he had the audience compare these two symbols, these two paintings, right, and, and to show that um, there were similarities between Santa Barbara and Shango. And, and I had never heard of Shango. Um, I had heard of Santa Barbara, right? So as I was, um, you know, as he's asking the audience to take a look, he's looking at different symbolisms in terms of the way that the, the individuals are looking or the deities are looking, um, that the symbols of the things that they carry. And so, um, and then also kind of what, sort of power they are um, maybe harnessing or sending out <laughs> into the world. And so one of the biggest things um, that I remember from that lecture, and this was a long time ago, <laughs> was that um, the similarities between Shango and Santa Barbara is that they're both um, deities that deal with thunder. Um, and they have the, the sword or they have the, um, the axe. And I did remember this years later when I took Yoruba classes. So I was learning the Yoruba language and I learned about Shango in the Yoruba context. Ah, and okay. I was like, wait a minute, Yoruba, Shango means thunder. So oh. when I, whenever I hear thunder, <laughs> I now say to myself, it's Shango, yeah. right? So like uh, that, that symbolism really sticks with me, but I liked the way that he would talk about looking at different representations that people put down into mediums, whether it's um, paintings, whether it's um, carvings or appliques, and how behind each one of those is a symbol. And, and we are here to interpret those symbols, but we may not interpret them in the same way as the person who put them down. Right. Um, and that also the symbols may change over time. And that was what he was sort of getting at at that lecture. And I was, it was brilliant. But I love the way he said, just like you did, look at them. Look at these um, pieces of material culture. Try to find similarities and find differences because they're not exactly the same, right? There's so many things that are very different, but looking at the similarities and the fact that he has such an extensive collection, right. he can look at many different representations of Santa Barbara, many different representations of Shango, and compare all of them. So he has this like vast collection uh, of knowledge in his head because he's actually looking at all of the different artifacts. Yeah, yeah. There's so much to think about with all of the uh, pieces in his collection and yeah, we've got some information on the, the labels in here to help you through that. We're just not going to try to get into the complexities of it today. I do not articulate it as well as our curators did to put it together. <laughs> so um, I'm not going to try to uh, go into those details. But definitely, if you have questions about uh, any of the individual pieces or the deities that they represent, put them in the questions, um, and we will try to help you answer them. If we don't know, we will talk to the curators, and we will get you answers. So that's all of possibility. This is uh, about all we're going to do with Dr. Montalus's exhibit tonight. Um, one thing I think is interesting to show you as we walk through the rest of the exhibit quickly is that we do have other materials here in the museum uh, that are also from Africa, but they're really different. Um, and we don't have a lot that's from the Caribbean in here. That's more limited. Um, but Dr. Montalus's collection is here on loan to us. And the museum, the collections that we have, uh, we don't have an acquisitions budget. Um, we get the materials that people choose to uh, donate to us. And so it can be a little bit of an eclectic collection. 
um, because of that. But one of the collections that we have that's fabulous um, is uh, the Von Berg collection, um, which was donated to us in the 1980s. Um, and includes all of these pieces of art, um, this is just a small sample of it, that are from southern Africa primarily. We have ostrich eggs, um, we have other um, pieces of carved wood, a snuff box, they're beautiful, but it's a really different collection from Dr. Montalus, who's from Haiti, his ancestors were from West Africa, um, and it's very interesting to me to see the difference in what somebody chooses to collect depending on what their focus is, what their interest is, um, and what their own background is. Uh, and to go from the vibrant colors um, on the walls of Dr. Montalus' exhibit to these much more subtle um, pieces of artwork is just an interesting comparison to think about. And so um, whenever you're looking at a museum collection, I always encourage you to think about how that collection comes to be, and that may vary depending on the museum. Uh, so ours tends to be a lot of archaeology from Detroit because that's what we've been doing here in the department for a long time. And then we have these specialized collections that have come to us from local people primarily or from former students. Um, and so it's a little bit all over the place. One of my favorite pieces um, in this collection, which doesn't go past it, is this mask um, with the shells on it. It's actually um, made from a European uh, military helmet. Um, and that was transformed um, into a mask. We didn't even realize it at first when we were putting it together for the exhibit. Uh, and then we found some of the notes on it and started looking at it inside. And we're like, sure right. enough, that is uh, a transformed piece of uh, material culture. So, yeah, I, I found it interesting um, when just you know when you were all putting together this exhibit and when Mary was curating it and when Dr. Montalus was showing all of the breadth uh, and the depth and the breadth of his work yeah. about the what kind of a job it is to be a curator. Mm. So like the, all, of, all of the art is out there, all of the material culture is out there, and one person or a group of people are trying to gather it in some sort of scheme, and I found that really interesting because I am a cultural anthropologist. I don't do much museum work. This is my first sort of foray into just being a, a side person on a, on a yeah. museum project. And, and found that really interesting because there was so much to choose from mm -hmm. and how we, how we select and what we select and what we put together is really important. And I thought that, that the group who did this did it in a really thoughtful manner and always with Dr. Montalus giving the final say. Right, right. Yes. You know, that was really important. I remember how long it took uh, he and Mary uh, and a little bit of me, I gave the outsider perspective on it um, to figure out how to lay out the uh, objects that were on the wall and how we were going to try to sort these um, when it is such a complicated issue. And um, uh, you know, do we put putting the eye of Legba sort of in the center and right. giving it its own label um, because that was a piece of particular importance. But trying to sort through all of this, I mean, it was a lot of conversation and discussion to figure out um, what was going to work best. And I think we came up with a really good result. Um, but it's amazing how you can spend so much time focusing on one little thing of how high should I be or how close should these be. Yeah. So why don't we walk through briefly just the rest of the gallery. You can see there's a lot more to see. Um, again, collections from um, all over the place. We have a lot of archaeology of Detroit in here, but we do have materials from around the world. Um, and this is part of an exhibit that was really intended to reflect all of the different aspects of what the museum has done. So it's got quite a bit of, um, not, I keep using the word eclectic, I'm using it too much, that's my word of the day, I guess. <laughs> uh, this section here really reflects a lot of the archaeology in Detroit. Um, there's a photo there of some of our students and Dr. Brzezinski in the Grandy Ballroom, um, home of MC5. Uh, with their materials from there. Uh, we do contemporary archaeology work. That's really Dr. Rzewski's focus. Uh, and then we also have all sorts of projects that have happened in the city since the 60s. There was a lot of construction that happened um, downtown um, during the 60s that led to the unearthing of materials um, that were from earlier generations here in Detroit. And so Dr. Pilling, our founder, uh, would go down there with students and tried to collect what he could. And then several of his students ended up getting into cultural resource management, mm -hmm. um, which is a uh, form of archeology span where you're going out and trying to document these sites before 
um, they get destroyed if construction is going up. Uh, so I think we may have just panned across a couple of the pictures that are on the wall here. These are some of my favorites. These are from uh, before the Renaissance Center existed. Most people can't remember a town without the Renaissance Center, but there, there was one. And uh, that's right down near the river, and there were a lot of uh, French ribbon farms in that area. And then later on, um, other people continued to live down there. And so we've got uh, materials being excavated there. This is uh, our two-seater privy. So that's the, oh, the old right. toilets. Uh, that uh, wood preserves really well here in Detroit. We don't have that, they didn't keep it for us, um, but we, we have the chamber pots that go with it. So um, it's an eclectic collection for sure, um, but uh, we've got great preservation in the city and so we've got leather shoes, we have all of these materials um, and that is a large part of what we do at the museum. The gallery is a very small part of what we do um, and really we're a repository for these collections for researchers and for educators uh, and so soon we're going to go over across the hall to see those. Yeah. Um, do we have great. any questions coming in? Maybe we should head back to the front of the gallery and then we can take questions there. I have to do the, the tour right. guide walk. We're backing, <laughs> we're backing up. Right. <laughs> and walking through the So tour Marta tour. asks, how do you acquire your artifacts, art, etc.? Is there a primary curator? So um, I think you've answered a little bit of that, but yeah, yeah. we have uh, several faculty together that make up a committee for the museum. Um, and those can change from year to year, depending on uh, people's interests and what other work they're doing for the university. Um, I'm the director of the museum, but I'm the only full-time staff member. Uh, so I do a little bit of everything. Um, Gordon Grosskopf, who the museum is named after, was a curator of archeology span here for a long time. Uh, he just passed away in this past year. Um, but he was involved with a lot of our original um, early acquisitions and collecting. Um, and most of the collection is archaeological materials from the Tri-County area. Uh, but in terms of other materials, we've had faculty bring materials back when they go and do research in other countries. Um, we've had students who have brought us objects. Um, so it's really quite variable um, how things come to be here. Um, but the intentional focus for collections is related to Detroit archaeology. We try to be the repository for uh, all archaeology that's going on in the region if people are looking for a place to uh, uh, store their collections. Uh, companies, again, cultural resource management companies, we work with them so that those materials are available to our researchers but also to the community um, so they can learn more about their history through them. We try to keep that stuff here. One more question? Um, it's not a question, but it is someone saying, thank you for showing us such beautiful and colorful artifacts. Oh, yeah. Isn't it a great yeah. collection? It's uh, fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a really wonderful collection, and we're really lucky that Dr. Montalus is willing to share it with us. And sure. Stuart says Dr. M is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> love the colors, love the backstories, <laughs> such craft. And then Marta came back in and said, do you look at the artifacts provenance? origin, lineage, etc. How do you certify that? Oh, okay. That is a complicated question. Um, so we do try to look at those things. Um, we haven't had that much that's come in since I've been here. Mm -hmm. um, and so I haven't done as much of that um, at this point. But um, we do try to make sure and we, uh, we try to be very thoughtful about understanding how a piece was acquired if it was ethically acquired, um, especially when we're dealing with things like archeological materials that can come up more and more. Um, before we agree to accept something, we really want to understand um, that legally or not, was it also ethically um, moved from one place to another? Mm -hmm. uh, and so for example, some of the pieces that were in the Von Berg collection, uh, that was something I was interested in with them. I was like, how did they get these? Um, and Dr. Von Berg uh, was a, a hunter and one of the things that he would do, we have an oral history with him. Um, we have a map of how he had things laid out in his own house. We have all this records about it, um, is he would trade with local communities. If he hunted an animal, he was not interested in the meat. Um, and so he would trade uh, the meat with local communities to get those pieces. Um, and then we have all of the paperwork for transporting them back here and that kind of thing. Um, so we do try to keep records of that and, and inform ourselves about that as we're moving forward. Um, and now Marcy, you work in Benini today. Um, one of the things we wanted to talk about was sort of the 
the fruits of uh, Dr. Montalusi's academic tree. Um, he's had a lot of students that have come out of Wayne State, both as undergrads and graduate students, yeah. who have gone on to do other kinds of things. So what are you doing and what are some of the other sorts of things um, that the Montalus <laughs> academic family <laughs> is up to? Yeah, you know, there's a great, um, there's a great story that Montalus told us, Dr. Montalus told us uh, years ago, which was about the importance of elders telling stories underneath trees. So like, if there was something important that the community needed to learn, an elder would gather everyone around and have the young people sit down under a tree and tell them a story. And the story always has um, a meaning, it has a moral, and the moral would be related to maybe an issue that was going on in the community, or maybe some kids were fighting, or, or maybe somebody was saying that somebody felt that they were better than them. Whatever the story was, an elder would have, or whatever the issue was, an elder would have a story that would bring out a way for the community to maybe resolve that issue. And so if we can look really quickly over here before we head out, you see this is an elder um, telling a story. Others are sitting underneath the tree and they're listening. So um, a few years ago, uh, my colleagues and I, we created an organization called Three Sisters, Les Trois Sœurs, um, in, in Benin. And one of the things that we focus on is education and literacy. And, and my colleagues who are all Beninese noticed that kids in the community didn't have any books to read in the language that they actually speak at home. And so we thought one of the things we could do would be to translate other stories, but that sort of defeats the purpose. We wanted the stories from Benin, so we started a project, had elders tell folk tales to young people. We translated them, transcribed them, and then the young people used those with artists as creative outlets to illustrate books and created children's books based on the stories. So that's just one outcropping uh, of um, one of the fruits uh, of Dr. Montalus's labor. His other students have gone on to do work in Haiti, in Togo, in, um, in the Caribbean, um, also in Benin, on many, many different things. So um, the fruits of his labor are, are extending beyond. So yeah, he has many um, what we call academic grandchildren around the world. Mm -hmm. Children and grandchildren. <laughs> and you guys ended up making an exhibit out of your most recent project when you were in Benin, didn't you? Yeah, we did. We had a um, what we called the pop-up museum. It was a one-month museum. Um, artists, uh, we worked with artists, we worked with the children, created a full house full of um, material culture, and we just got a grant to be able to bring that to the U.S. and then to send it back. So we also know the importance of, um, you know, so reciprocity. The, art, the exhibit will travel here to the U.S. and then it'll go back to Benin and will be housed in Benin. So we are hoping that we're going to have that exhibit here in our museum in the future, so stay tuned. Uh, hopefully we're going to sort of see the next phase, I like to think of it, of um, what Dr. Montalus has done through um, the work of Marcy and her collaborators over in Benin. And Steve dropped in a link to threesisters.org. Oh, so thanks, Steve. Wow. That's what's up. Thank you. So let's go across the hall. Always has our back. Yeah. Oh, got to do, right, do the tour thing. <laughs> Vibrant wings. <laughs> uh, so I mentioned that in addition to the gallery, um, we have a large uh, research collection. So we actually have a lab across the hall from the gallery, which you are welcome to come into now. And we'll show you some of the work we're doing in here. So, hi, John. Hi. <laughs> so this is our museum laboratory uh, that we use to um, teach classes in. We teach our archaeological laboratory methods classes in here. Um, we do an array of um, coursework, classes that will visit us. We have school groups that come in to visit us here. This is also where we create a lot of the content that ends up in the gallery. So we have printers, um, drafting material, uh, and all that sort of thing. Um, so we can create what we're um, interested in putting in the gallery. And we have museum studies courses. Those students are in here as well working on projects. Uh, and one of the projects we have going right now that John's been working on for us, that he'll show you, is uh, looking at an archeological site that was excavated here in Detroit in the 1960s uh, called Fort Lerneau. It's also called Fort Shelby or Fort Detroit. It had a lot of names at different times. <laughs> um, and yeah. it's part of our Detroit archeological collections. And we got a small grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities to uh, evaluate the way we store those collections and improve our storage to make them more accessible to researchers in the community. And as part of that, we're 
testing out how long it takes us to rebox some of these materials that haven't seen the light of day in several decades. Um, so, John, what have you been looking at today, and what have you, uh, what have you found? Yeah, so today I've been working, um, working on re-inventorying re some of these artifacts. Um, we have some porcelain right here. Um, so this would have been imported from China. This particular one is uh, porcelain with a willow pattern. And they all go into the, their own separate bags. We have the site number, the site name, the uh, um, acquisition number, and the profile um, from where it was found, the context, as well as the number and the name. So that way we know exactly where this object came from. Um, besides the porcelain, we also have wooden objects. So we have um, the tree nails, which are uh, right here. They were used primarily as um, kind of like fasteners within timber framing or boat building. This one's fairly small. They come in all sizes. Uh, they are quite a bit different than, say, pegs that were also recovered. This is, as you can see, much more crude. It's very um, round and it's bent and it's very robust. There's also bits of bone that were found and other fragments of wood. Uh, an interesting find today has actually been um, this little button over here. And so this button was discovered um, during the excavations and it just kind of went into its own little box and not really much else was done with it. Uh, by looking at it under a microscope, we were able to see that it had what looked to be a one and an A surrounded by laurels or a wreath of some kind. Um, by doing a bit of research and figuring out what sort of military units were stationed here, we found out that the best case scenario for this um, was actually the Queen's Rangers, and that was during their second formation between 1791 and 1802. And we actually have a photo of what a new one or a better preserved one would have looked like. So just to show you what that uniform looked like, this right here is um, an officer's grade um, uniform coat, regimental coat. That's cool. Yeah, and one of the reasons that's so interesting with this fort is um, Fort Lerno went back and forth between the hands of the British and the American multiple times. Uh, and so uh, I've got to check my charts again. Uh, between 1778 and 1796, it was in the hands of the British. And so this regiment was only founded in 1791. So that gives us an even narrower window, 1791 to 1796 for this piece. And that could mean that other objects that were found in the same context as this are going to be from that British time period at the site. And so as we're trying to figure out what's representing the American occupation, what's representing the British occupation, uh, these kinds of objects can help us with that. And they're, they're fun to, to research. We've got a lot of wood that's preserved at this site, which is amazing, but it's not as thrilling to sort through. There's not as much that we can uh, learn from each individual piece in quite the same way. As a collection, they're great. Um, there we go. <laughs> yeah, there's a little sample of the vast majority of the wood that we find. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, but it's amazing that it's preserved for as long as it has. Um, the long time. Forts um, was, uh, they stopped using the fort in 1826, 1827. Um, so to have these materials still um, preserved from there. And we can do work on them. We'll try to figure out uh, what kinds of trees they're made from. Um, that could tell us something about uh, what the environment was like at the time. Uh, so there's definitely information we can get out of those fragments. Um, uh, but finding these little pieces like the coin that are currently in a storage box in a large room, um, getting them separated out so that we can more easily access them uh, for research and analysis is really helpful. That's really cool. Yeah. This is your big old inventory sheet? Yes, and so this is <laughs> one of two very large binders that have um, just all the artifacts inventory. And so these are actually just copies of the original inventory sheets um, that we have in our archives. This one is just all the numbers that we have for the Fort Lanoe site below um, 100,000. We have another one right over there that has even more. And um, it's, it's gonna take a while. Yes, <laughs> yes, so this is an ongoing slow project that we're working on. 
Um, I know we've been at this for a little while. I don't know if we have time for more questions or if we need to wrap it up. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Okay. Um, Martha asks, you mentioned that some of the artifacts on exhibit are on loan. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that when he leaves and finishes his work at WSU, that their artifacts that the, these artifacts revert to him. They will no longer be part of the museum? Uh, so that's a great question. Uh, these are Dr. Montalus's personal collection. Um, and so uh, I don't know what he's going to do with them uh, <laughs> once he decides if he is going to uh, take them all home with him or not. Uh, that's up to him. <laughs> um, uh, so we'll have to wait and see. Um, perhaps some of them will stay here. Perhaps um, none of them will. I'm not really sure. Um, his collection as a whole um, could be its own museum. It's there, there's so much there, so we'll just have to wait and see um, what's going to go on with those. But uh, we'll keep you posted, and maybe we'll get to exhibit more of his material. Um, it's a wonderful collection, so I, I hope we'll get to do that too. Okay. Good. You want to give everybody the hours again, and when oh, they can come sure. visit? Yes. So um, please come visit us. We're open Tuesdays through Fridays, uh, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. during the academic year. We're closed over spring break, so the week of the 14th. Don't come that week. I'll be here. You can come visit me. Knock on my office door. Um, but the gallery won't be open. So um, in the summer, we'll have slightly adjusted hours, but Dr. Montalus's exhibit will be uh, up um, for a long time to come, probably through the rest of 2022. Um, so please come by and see that. And if you are interested in organization and you like details, you should think about becoming an anthropologist. Um, and talk to us about museum <laughs> careers too. Uh, it takes a lot of uh, uh, patience and uh, you can watch Netflix at the same time. Whatever you gotta do, we, uh, um, we make it through. But um, we'd love to have you come join us at the museum. So Marcy, yeah. thank you. Don, thank you. thank you. Everyone out in the world, thanks for visiting <laughs> us. Um, feel free to drop more questions in the comments and we'll keep checking them. So, bye. Thanks. bye.